Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to the Brassica Crop and Agronomy webinar. Uh, my name is Rebecca Stilton, and I'm one of the product managers for the crop protection business, um, and I'll be hosting the meeting this morning. So just a couple of um, housekeeping uh, slides before we get going. So you may have noticed that we're recording um, this webinar and this webinar will be hosted on our Syngenta YouTube channel. So you'll be able to, to view that um, freely afterwards. We thoroughly enjoy um, and encourage questions. So if you could please use the, um, the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. If you can't see it already, if you hover your mouse towards the bottom of the screen, you'll get a black bar come up. Um, and if you can use the Q&A, uh, to type any questions to, to myself or the panellists. Um, we'll go through answering those at the end. You should receive an email tomorrow, um, which will include links to um, claim basis and Rosso points if those are applicable to yourself, um, and also a link to a small feedback survey, um, which we'd be grateful for you to complete uh, so we can shape these meetings going forwards. So what you're going to hear this morning, um, we'll kick off by hearing from Nigel. Nigel is going to go through um, a bit of a weather update for us and a market review for um, broccoli and cabbage. He'll then talk to us about the varieties um, and what the breeding goals are going forward. After, my, after Nigel, we'll hand over to Louis um, and Louis will give us a review of the Syngenta Brussels sprout and cauliflower varieties um, and how they provide value for the grower. After that, we'll go to Michael, um, who will take us through a fungicide crop protection update. Um, and then we'll finish off the meeting with Max Newbert, who will take us through an insecticide update. So without further ado, we'll kick off. Um, and I'll ask Nigel if he can please share his presentation. Good morning. Good morning, Rebecca. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, we'll just uh, get this fixed up, hopefully shortly, should open. Uh, okay. Um, what you'll have to do, Rebecca, is as per normal, confirm that you can see that and that everybody can see that on the screen. That's perfect. Thank you, Nigel. Lovely. Well, as I say, good morning, everybody. My name's Nigel Kingston. Um, work for Syngenta now for nearly 17 years, responsible for onions and all cabbages and broccoli. Um, I'm just going to run through, through these slides for you. Um, I always start with the weather. Uh, those people who know me um, know that uh, I'm pretty fanatical about that. Because I think over the years, and it's, as you can see, there's a fair bit of gray hair here. Uh, every farmer that I go to, we always start with the weather. Uh, it's not my, my choice, but uh, I'm happy to discuss it. And they always want to discuss that. Also crop areas, market, breeding names uh, for Syngenta, um, our broccoli and cabbage varieties. And then just a little conclusion at the end. So, uh, we we'll start here with the weather and the, the areas, and I, I put these, these areas up. Uh, as you can see there at the top, I'm just gonna change my slider here. Um, pointer options, laser pointer. This is Cooper up in Scotland, and this is July, only joking guys. Um, this is, uh, but it is colder, it's a colder area and a cooler area. And uh, we've had a, a much cooler area, a cooler year this year. Lincolnshire, Boston, because when I Googled, I actually Googled weather in these areas, and this is what came up. Deal, obviously they had a lovely uh, spring, and uh, I'll talk about that. Botley, warmer, more than, than average. Uh, hail was quite a, a, a mixed bag. We got some beautiful weather, but then there was some very, very heavy showers. And Lancashire, Hesketh Bank, wow. Bracky had a lot of, lot of rain this year. We start off with uh, uh, Boston area. You can see, and then this area is, is Cooper in Scotland. The Boston, I think uh, 
it was an exceptionally dry May and there was a lot of aphids around at that time as well because we had a, a quite a mild uh, winter. Um, so there was a lot of aphids early in May and also into June. It was cooler than average June and July and January was the same. And actually Scotland and Cooper was very, very similar. Very, very similar to, to, uh, to Boston in Lincolnshire. However, it was actually cooler. So cooler than average June and July, just like Boston. And then um, in January, 2021, below average temperatures. I think that was the same in most places. Then going up here, you've got a uh, deal in Kent, uh, above average temperatures most of the year. This is uh, the, the line, which is your average. And this is the temperatures in uh, 2020. Um, hail, same, but they had a very wet February and also uh, quite a wet June as well. So that was the differences. Um, right, so Hesketh Bank, Lancashire, look at this. It was off the scale, uh, the wettest February they've ever recorded. Um, and really several months were above average rainfall. So Lancashire has been exceptionally wet. And although I didn't put Ireland in there, uh, the north of Ireland was... was It's very, very wet as well. Uh, and Botley down, down in the south was, was quite a lot warmer uh, than average right the way through the year. July there was a little bit below, but look, most of the year was above, above average. So in terms of temperature, and it was very dry. Look at this May, like a lot of places, very, very dry in May. So these uh, were, were from the Met Office, straight from the Met Office. You can see here, exceptionally below the average, and that was uh, March, April and May, but May was the month that was, was much below average. And it was actually the sunniest 2020, 695.5 hours of sunshine. So that's straight from the Met Office as well. So it's one of the, the sunniest uh, springs. So, uh, so March, April, May, yeah, yeah, there was very, very, a lot of sunshine. And then September actually was also uh, very dry. Certainly I was in Scotland um, in September and towards the end of September, uh, things were really getting dry and then they had a huge amount of rainfall. Um, but February, uh, October and uh, and. I mean, if you look at the February rainfall in Lancashire here, you can see that it was way above average, way above average. And consequently, uh, we've had some of this, um, quite a lot of damage in crops again. Um, soil conditions, sadly, pretty poor. And uh, even the finest of Syngenta varieties, I, I couldn't get uh, to, to go through that. This is in... Uh, in uh, Ju Ju June, this was in June when I was looking at the cabbages and there was a lot of aphid about. And then we got this, we got turnip mosaic virus and, I, and I've seen that around. So I think there's gonna be a few issues there potentially. Um, now, the it was the biggest cabbage um, area that we've had uh, in recent years and Consequently, the prices have been very, very tough, um, but also the coronavirus hasn't helped us as well. Um, because of processing, there hasn't been a market uh, like there would be normally for the processing. Uh, the whole head trade has been better uh, that people have found. Uh, supermarkets have been very busy. The broccoli area was the third highest area in 10 years, that surprised me, 500 hectares above average. Um, High demand early on, well, you can see this demand here was very high. And that was obviously due to the fact that um, we had a very cool uh, start. So basically we wanted a lot of broccoli there and, uh, and there, there was you know, very, very good prices to start. The Savoy area, 
it increased uh, from 2019, but those two areas are still the uh, two smallest in the last 10 years. Uh, prices have been reasonable um, for whole head. Uh, the demand has been consistent through the supermarkets. This is the wholesale market price, but it's been reasonably consistent. Very good demand now, actually. Um, but it has been poor demand from proce the processors uh, due to food services, which is understandable again. Pubs and restaurants closed. It's a real shame. So breeding goals. Breeding goals are, uh, as you can see, club root uh, here. Um, Umbulgo, um, White Blister, um, Micah Sparella, Bear, um, Xanthomonas as well in this, um, and also Danny Mildew, uh, systemic Danny Mildew is, uh, is something that is we're seeing more of. Um, and I did highlight uh, the club route because of club route we're seeing more and more and more, and uh, and we have some. Very, very good varieties against that. One of those varieties, it's an early variety, Karate. Uh, we've introduced it uh, this year, uh, 323, SGS 323. Um, it's a small uh, pre packed variety. Um, it's 75 to 85 days. In Ireland, I've sent this, this picture here by one of our I Irish customers, and he actually planted some really, really late. We seem to have um, misplaced a Nigel. So um, while we try and gain him back, um, we will kick off by starting um, to show Louis's presentation. So Louis, if you can um, turn your cameras on. Good morning, everyone. So on a little bit earlier than expected, um, I am going to have to rely on Rebecca today because I had a um, homeschooling mishap with my laptop and it's now no longer working. So Rebecca's going to um, be the next slide, please. So as I said, I'm Louis Stokes. I look after Brussels sprouts and cauliflower in the UK. So I'll run through those two portfolios just now. Nigel's given us a really good update of the weather so I won't bother cover, covering that again what I'll do is I'll have a look at the areas of Brussels sprouts and then because we've got such a big portfolio of sprouts I'm going to just look at the highlights and new varieties for 2021 next slide please so there is a sprout area from 2015 through to 2020 so in 2015 we were around 3,000 hectares and that has fallen gradually to this year to around 2,440, I think it was. Some of that is from reduced demand, but some of it is also from increased yield from the varieties. I do keep telling our breeders that they are um, causing me problems by not being able to sell seed, by giving you higher yielding varieties, but we don't seem to be listening and we're still aiming for, for more yield. So I'll see less seed sales, but you'll see more profit hopefully at the end. Um, I'd imagine 21 is gonna be similar again to 2020. Um, I don't see any massive changes at the moment, but it is crystal ball time and with COVID and everything, who knows what's going to happen. But I think they'll stick around about 2,450 mark. Next slide, please. So highlights of 2020, I think one of the best varieties I saw out there was Martinus. This is a November harvest variety. It was originally selected up in Scotland um, because it's so good against light leaf spot, but it's now performing throughout the UK. Uh, 2019, it did really well as well. And again, in 2020, fits in in November, nice dark colored sprout. And um, if you remember Helenus, it's a nice replacement for that. So it's in most people's programs, but if you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth having a look at because it's performing well in yield and quality and really good against disease. Next slide, please. Hey Melis is a slightly newer variety, similar timing to Martinus, um, a bit taller, um, and I'd say the button set on it is a bit nicer than in Martinus, so it's a nice button presentation. d leaves really easily, and with a small cutting point, it's also suitable for mechanical trimming as well. 
dovetails in nicely with Martinez, so it gives you loads of cover in that November period. Hay Mallet will also hold through into December and makes a really nice stalk if you're looking for that in the autumn or in the winter time up till Christmas. Next slide, please. So we also run a breeding program for trimming sprouts to go through mechanical trimmers. These are trim top and trim star. They are slightly elongated buttons. You can't really tell when you're looking at them. Me and you probably can, but the customer won't. But they just allow the sprout to orientate slightly better on the trimming machines and also reduce that cut area when they're trimming as well. So trim top is the first one of these two. It's a November timing. Um, you can plant it early as well and nice even spacing on the stalk. Next slide, please. Trim star follows on nicely from trim top, so November and December. What really stands out about trim star is, other than the yield, which is higher than in the trim top, but um, it's got really good field standing ability. So it can hold really well in the field and it has excellent shelf life. So if you want to hold it in store as well for a little while and then build up before the Christmas period, it works really well. And they line up perfectly on mechanical trimmers and go through to be um, trimmed ready for that market, which I think is probably growing. There's more and more convenience outlets um, as we go. So we see trimming as an important part of our programme. We've got other varieties coming through that we're having a look at in trials at the moment as well to fill, fill the programme out from start to end. Next slide, please. New introduction in 2020 was Scorpius. Some of you may know it as 1698. I first saw this variety in 2018, which if you remember was a really dry year and a lot of varieties struggled for height and we got leaf entrapment between the buttons. Um, Scorpius stood out because it got some space between the buttons, good yield and um, the leaf drop was really good on it. It's a late profitous timing, but unlike profitous, there's no planting restrictions. So you've got no risk of bolting with it but it presents a button very similar to what you would see with Profitus and it was treating in a similar way in the field. So not too much fertilizer on it. It, it wants to be kept a little hungry, if anything, because of the vigor there. And fits really well in that December timing. So it takes you on from Profitus through towards Christmas. Next slide, please. Platinus, been around for a couple of years. Um, it's an early Petrus, so will fit really nicely for Christmas. Really dark sprout with a good yield. Once again, this was selected because of its disease tolerance. So really good against like leaf spot, but against all diseases, it works really well as well. So it stays clean. And I know this year, a few people struggled to get in with sprayers in early December when maybe they would have liked to have done for the January harvest time. So if we've got these varieties that are more tolerant to, to disease, you won't be able to reduce your spray programme, but it gives you a little bit of flexibility. So if you're a bit late, it gives you a little bit more security when we've got this excellent um, tolerance to disease. One thing I would mention with Platinus is it doesn't want to be on your more marginal brassica land. It does need looking after. So it wants to be on your best land, otherwise it won't get the height. So it's just one to watch out for. Next slide, please, Rebecca. So that was all I was going to mention on sprouts today. Today we've obviously got um, we go from abacus in August time right through till March with Splendus, and we've got two or three varieties at each time in. So if you do want to go through the whole program in more detail with me and select something that suits you, feel free to give me a call. I'm sure you've got my details, or if not, um, somebody in Syngenta will be able to pass them on to you. I'll move on to cauliflower now. Um, once again, with cauliflower, we've got a big program there um, with a big range of cauliflowers. So I'll just look at the highlights and new varieties, but starting again with the areas that were grown. On this chart here, you can see summer cauliflower in blue, autumn in orange, and then winter cauliflowers in grey. Um, pretty stable, sort of between nine and 10,000 hectares. There was an increase in cauliflower, winter cauliflower last year. And from 2019 to 2020. And I think I saw a lot of that was coming up for the Christmas period and people were wanting to be less reliant on imports. And I think that probably worked out quite well for most people with the problems with logistics 
um, around COVID and Brexit in December time and Laurie's not coming over from France. So that extra collie that was planted for the Christmas period, I think all got harvested. So I would imagine it will stay the same there again. Who knows what's going to happen with food service going forward. If we open up in June from COVID rules, it could help a little bit of volume there. But at the moment, everyone's unsure, I think. So it'll be interesting to see for 2021. Next slide, please. So there's our full program of cauliflower. I won't go through each variety individually, but you can start with speed start. So over winter sowing, um, ready for harvest in May. And we go right the way through to something like Dell on, on Mayfair, our very long cycle varieties, which are ready for end of April and, and May the following year. But I'll just concentrate on the highlights and new varieties. Next slide, please. So our macro is a summer or autumn cauliflower, fits nicely in both timings, really reliable varieties, around 90 days to maturity. It has excellent self-protection, but you, it's strange. You can actually see it. It's quite easy to see in the field when it's ready. And because of this, you get really high percentage cuts. The harvest teams love harvesting it when they go through a field because they can tell when a head's ready, even though it's got this nice cover to it. It just shows itself really well. So we see high percentage to cut, 75, 80% aren't unusual. And what we've also seen with our macro is that it doesn't go pink. So where we've seen a few varieties last summer going pink, um, our macro has um, stayed its um, true colour and, and been able to be held in the field and used for every market that you can think of, either fresh or into processing. And it's just reliable, it fits there and doesn't let you down. Um, it can also be sown in the autumn for springtime as well. Next slide, please. There we go. I thought nothing was going to happen then. Andromeda. Andromeda is from one of our, our real white cauliflower range. So this is where we've isolated the white gene in there. September, October timing, a bit faster than our magro, 75 days. And it's got an open growth habit, but it stays white in the sun. But what you also see with um, Andromeda is that even after harvest, it stays white. So what I do when I'm out in the field, I cut a head when it's ready and I'll either leave it in the car or I'll leave it out in the field for a few days in the sunshine. And it still maintains that white color. So it gives you a really good quality curd at that time of year, really nice white color. Once again, Andromeda can be sown in the autumn as well for June harvest. So you can start off with a speed star followed by Andromeda and then into our magro before you move into your spring sowing. So it's quite a flexible variety there. Next slide, please. So onto new varieties now. Um, these are more looking at the long cycle timing. So Casham is an autumn variety. It's in the Daiwan segment. So late November and into early December really healthy plant and we get some really high percentage cuts with cashin as well. Um, it was introduced in 2020, so we saw a lot of it this um, last December, end of November, December. It worked really well with curd quality as well, it looked really nice. What you'll, I feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit because we keep talking about really healthy plants and really good percentage cuts with all the new varieties, but that's what we're aiming for when we're breeding now. Um, so the healthy plant leads to healthier curds and higher percentage cutouts. So you'll see me mentioning it a few times with these new varieties. Um, I won't apologize for it because it's about adding value for you guys and getting higher yields out of the crop that you're growing in the field. So next slide, please. So from Cashin, you would normally move into Leoson, and then after which takes you up to towards Christmas time. And then after Christmas, we've got a new variety or for mid to end of December, which is Liren 5073. We launched this last year after quite small trials, actually. We'd only seen not too, not too large an area out in the field, but it looked so good that we decided to bring it forward and get it out there. And I think it's worked really well. As I said earlier, um, it was a bit more collie grown around that Christmas time in the UK. Some of it was Liren and it worked really well at that time, mid to the end of December. 
nice vigor, healthy again, and really good curd quality, as you can see from that photo. Plenty of seed available for this, um, this season as well. So it ties in nicely with the Leoson and gives you a couple of options around that time. Next slide, please. So we will then move into January timings. Um, I think Alpen is the mainstay around there. Um, and we've got two new varieties which are helping out and giving us a bit of flexibility at that time. Akinen was new in 2020. It's early January, so obviously it was harvest 2021. Um, really nice vigor and curd quality, and it fits in just before Alpen. So you go Akinen and then into Alpen. And then next slide, please, Rebecca. And then after Alpen, you move into another new variety, Aminen. So we launched this in 2019, so it's been in its second season now, performing really well. Once again, it's a healthy variety with good cover and high yields, but it fits in this difficult slot as well, which has always been difficult with January timing. Uh, Alpen performs really well, but with Akinen and Aminen alongside it, it's really helping out there in giving you reliability of supply throughout that difficult time of year. Next slide, please, Rebecca. And finally, I want to mention a trial variety, 5086, but it sort of ties in with the um, breeding targets that um, Nigel was talking about. Now, this is a um, ring spot resistant variety, similar timing to the Aminen, and we're just trying it this year to see what that brings out in the field. Um, the same with on Brussels sprouts, I'm trying a variety that is ring spot and albugo resistant. And we're trying that in some spray programs to see how that works in helping you out as growers. Um, I don't believe it will reduce the number of sprays, but how we can fit that into a fungicide program and how it can give you the flexibility. And we're looking at it the same in 5086 as well. So it's not just available yet in cauliflower and um, Brussels sprouts, but it's something we're working on and looking at and how we can deliver this value to you and how you can use it out in the field. So it's going to be really interesting looking at those trials going forward. So that was me for today. If you've got any questions, please put them in the chat or in the question and answer session. I'll just mention that we are running our Lincolnshire summer demo in June and autumn, COVID permitting. So all the plants are going to be going in. If we can't do a face to face demo, we will do something on webinars or video on YouTube and we'll work out a plan for that as we go forward. But hopefully, hopefully, definitely by the autumn, you'll be able to come and see us in the field and it'd be nice to see some faces again rather than on computer screens and Nigel disappearing off somewhere into the into the cloud somewhere. So thanks for listening and any questions, please put them in the Q&A. That's great. Thank you, Louis. Well, I think Nigel has rejoined us from the ether. So if we uh, try and pick up where we lost you, Nigel, if we can uh, give that a go. Now, let's give it another go. Whoa. Um, right, can we see my screen? Not quite yet. No. Oh, no. do I need to? Um... No. Hang on, try again. No. Can you come back to us, Rebecca? because I can't, I can't get that screen up again. For some reason, I've lost it again. Can you see the share? Yeah, I can. Brilliant. Let's start again. Can you see that? Yeah, just chuck it in presentation mode and then we're good to go. We'll give it a go. It was all going so swimmingly well. I'd actually finished the presentation. Can we see that? Can you see that? I can see it, but it's not in presentation, mate. Oh, there we go. 
Yeah. Okay. Go okay, I think this is the slide where I finished off, where you lost me. Um, I wasn't aware that you'd lost me. I know we've got to carry on and crack on now, so I'm really sorry for that delay. I can't apologise enough. Um, I'm going to go straight to Karipa. Uh, it's a late uh, maturing Savoy that we've got, uh, 150 days. It's got all of the... Um, all of the resistances in terms of its um, its white blister, it's got uh, club root, and it's got mica spirella. It's um, yeah, it looks very very promising, very winter hardy. This is Kariba here. You can see it against one of our competitors. Uh, Killersole goes without saying. You can see Killersole here again next to something without club root resistance. Um, it's very uniform, good storage. It's been around a time, um, and it's it's ideal for kilo heads. It's a trusted, tried and trusted variety. And as I say, you can see the differences between that killer's old here and a non club root variety here. This is new Marconi. Uh, we trialed it. This is uh, the second year that I've seen it, and it's really stood out in in storage actually. Uh, for a start, it can be used for um, um, for processing, and it can also be used for uh, for the one kilo heads as well. So it's got it's got some real good attributes to it. It's also very strong against rip. Um, nice green colour after storage. It's easy to peel. It's low waste. It looks very very promising. Bestie. Um, variety that we've had some time now um what i would say is it is vital to keep it hungry um because if it gets nitrogen which it got in, in august after the rainfall it, it will blow it, it, you know but if you keep it hungry if you keep it really hungry um this variety here is obviously uh, can't stand uh, the conditions bestie here is very very strong it's also very good in an organic situation. Beanie, uh, Beanie is, uh, has been the standout performer for me. It's um, September, October harvest, uh, very uniform. It's high yielding and, um, and very, very uh, uniform. And uh, this is um, some of the results, independent trial results that we had. Um, very good in terms of Holostem as well. Um, I know it's excellent against uh, disease. And if you look at it as well, it's very, very high percentage cut out as well. Um, and the conclusions on it was a beanie was an excellent variety for late harvest. This has been seen over two years uh, um, on this particular trial. And it's, it's very, very good at the end. Better tolerance to holostone um, when climatic conditions favor rapid growth. Just very, just lastly, really, and I'm sorry for all the issues that you've got, um, but I mean, some of the work that's being done out there, this is some of the work on Twitter, I think is fantastic. The more we can promote uh, vegetables, the better, uh, in my opinion, and also educate the public. I mean, and our own, our own fieldsman, because I had a fieldsman ring me up and said, you know, we've got a lot of problems with this. Well, uh contamination well it's not just uh it's it, it is educating the fieldsmen but it's educating the public as well this is a hoverfly larvae and i mean that's a beneficial insect and if we can tell people that um that it's beneficial um and the more of that we can do i'm sure the better um it's as simple as that really and i, I once again i apologize for the delays but uh, enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Nigel. Right, so Michael, over to you for a fungicide update. If you could share your presentation for me, that'd be brilliant. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Michael Tate, uh, technical manager looking after potato products and veg. Just going to do uh, an update for you today on ve our veg fungicide area. If I can get my slides to move. 
Um, so what I'm going to start with is a bit of a regulatory update, because unfortunately in crop protection, we seem to be uh, constantly in a situation of regulatory flux. So I'm just going to say a few words about that. Um, briefly cover uh, sort of an overview of our new product pipeline and give you a sort of an update on some of our key veg brands at the moment. Um, I'm sure most of you will be pretty familiar with these, but it's more of a reminder than anything else. And finally, I'm going to say um, a few words about our new product, uh, Adepidin. So regulatory, um, you will probably have been aware that the European Union decided that um, they were going to discontinue or disallow use of Mancozeb, and that came through uh, at the end of January. Now, CRD decided that because this is occurring after the end of the so-called transition period, um, that they would take a different view, and they have now extended the use of Mancozeb in, uh, in crops in the UK for a three-year period. However, um, they're still able to um, curtail that should they think it's necessary uh, during that period. So that's one thing that um, CRD have sort of done to uh, show their independence from the EU. However, one thing that's uh, causing us some trouble at the moment is that uh, is metal axle M and the use of metal axle M as a component within seed treatments. So a number of our key products, including Apron, which is obviously widely used in veg seed, um, is subject to um, a directive which will probably mean we could lose uh, metal axle M as a seed treatment uh, product from the 1st of June. And at the moment, this is not particularly widely known or particularly well publicized by CRD. But when we look at the regulations, that's the situation that we face. We're currently um, negotiating, talking with CRD to see if we can get uh, this period extended to give growers a decent use up period and also for them to properly consider the information that we have um, provided them with. So at the moment, this is an ongoing situation, but at the moment, I think you need to be aware that potentially after um, the 1st of June, you won't be able to use uh, metal axle M based seed treatment products. This doesn't affect use of metal axle M as a foliar product. So that's just to make that clear. Now within um, the whole sort of Brexit situation, um, we will obviously be taking in future increasingly greater responsibility for our own regulatory decisions. But one of the things that's happening is that um, products after the transition period, which were um, due to be um, regulated upon, we're going to find that these active substances have their period extended by three years, pretty much the same sort of situation that we've seen already with uh, Mancozo. So for example, if we have a product um, which active substance might come up to it for expiry in 2022, uh, CRD will um, extend that for three years. So I think we've got a rolling program here within CRD to help them to manage the workload, uh, looking at a lot of these products which uh, were coming up for re-registration. So it's going to be a dynamic situation that people will have to keep an eye on to see which products get extended for this three-year period. Another issue which I think could give the industry some headaches in the future is going to be movement of seed, treated seeds. So in the past, if you've had an approval in mainland Europe, there's not been a problem to introduce uh, those seeds into the UK. However, after, 20, after 31st of December 2023, um, in order to move seed from Europe into the UK, that active ingredient will have to be approved in the UK. And furthermore, it will have to actually be approved on the crop that you're looking to import. So again, more issues that we're going to have to keep an eye on uh, going into the future, just to keep you sort of aware of that. At the moment, it looks as if it's still going to be possible to export seed satisfactorily from the UK into the EU, provided um, the product is registered in the EU. Few words now about our product sort of pipeline. Um, the main product we're introducing this year is going to be Arondis Plus. It's not unfortunately for use in brassica areas, but I'll just say a little bit about it anyway, so you're aware of it. Uh, we're still looking to try to get uh, Maxim 480 into lettuce and some other crops, the so-called second wave of, of crops for Maxim, but that's still ongoing. 
Finally, I will say a bit, as I mentioned earlier, about our new material, adepidin, uh, which is targeted uh, brassicas and carrots. I was going to cover something about Tegro, but Tegro is not currently um, in um, veg brassica, so I'll cover that another time, but it's a biological material that we're working with and looking to introduce on a broader front in the future. So just a few words about Arondis Plus. Arondis Plus is based on oxythiopiproline, which is a new active ingredient we jointly developed with uh, DuPont, Corteva as they are now. Um, and it's highly active material uh, and it will see use in allium crops and also in lettuce. And commercially, we're expecting to be able to bring this to the market in uh, May and it will be sold as a co-pack with Amistar. And the reason for this is so that we manage the risk of resistance developing in the uh, downy mildews, which it's targeted against. Uh, and um, so that's a, a new product for those areas. And we will no doubt expand use into other areas in future. Maxim, I've already mentioned that we're looking to introduce that into lettuce in the future, but it remains quite an important crop in the brassica area. Uh, we've lost things like thyram, so we've got fewer materials that are suitable um, as uh, general seed treatment uh, protectants. Uh, and Maxim fludioxinol is very effective in that role. We have obviously cabbage on label, and then a number of other crops are covered, uh, in brassica crops are covered by an emu. So I'm just gonna give you a short summary now about um, some of our veg brassica brands. We have four important ones, uh, Amistar, uh, Revis, Amistar Top and Plover, uh, all been in the market for a few years. So you're probably fairly familiar with their activity. Uh, just a, a little reminder here that um, Revis gives very good um, activity against downy mildew and broccoli. Uh, Nigel mentioned uh, that um, systemic downy mildew was becoming more of a problem. In this particular trial, you can see that the activity against downy mildew was improved where the Revis was applied with an adjuvant. Another important brand for us, of course, is Amistar Top which combines asoxystrobin and diphenoconazole. This gives it a broad label, both in terms of the crops you can treat and also in the number of diseases that you can get a good activity against. But there are constraints on the label in terms of maximum doses uh, and other issues like that, which require uh, careful management of the product in the field. Just a few uh, data sets here to show you um, activity against alternaria. Here you can see in this trial in sprouts, um, a reduction of disease from both Amistar Top and Amistar, very similar in this particular trial. Uh, this is looking at white blister activity, and you can see here Amistar Top giving slightly more control than Amistar on its own. And again, a useful attribute for the product. And finally, just a ring spot data there uh, to remind you of activity against uh, ring spot uh, as well. A few words about adepidin. Now this comes from the SDHI group. Uh, it's unusual chemistry and it has really a very good level of activity in um, vegetable brassicas and we will be introducing it in both cereals and a separate brand for use uh, in the veg crops. And our key target, and hopefully uh, this will come through for 2022, depending upon approval through CRD, Hopefully we'll get it through for use in brassicas where it is really astonishingly good uh, controlling a light leaf spot and very effective on the other key diseases as well. Just a single trial here I was going to show you at the moment. Um, you can see here that the, this trial mainly had light leaf spot as a problem and some of the um, traditional sort of uh, products like Amistar Top, Rudis, Perseus, not particularly effective against a light leaf spot, you can, but you can see there four doses of our new product, Depidin, highly effective. We won't get a four applications, so it will need to be used in combination with Amistar Top, and that's what AT stands for there. So you can either put the Amistar Top before or after the Depidin, but again, all of those options, highly effective at uh, uh, controlling light leaf spot. Just a few photographs to illustrate that. So this got untreated. Amistar Top, which I showed was reasonably effective. One of the potential competitors in the form of Rudis. 
In this particular trial, uh, Perseus was not particularly effective, as you will have noticed from the graph earlier on, and some really very good control where adepidin was used. So we're really looking forward to having this product along because we think it gives a real step change um, in how you'll be able to control light leaf spot. And of course, it gives you very good activity against quite a number of other important diseases. So that was all I was planning to say, and I would like to pass on to my colleague, uh, Max Newbert, to cover insecticides. Great, thank you, Michael. Can I just remind people, if you'd like to ask some questions, to tap those into the Q&A, um, or we'll go through those at the end. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Rebecca and Michael. Uh, yes, and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Max Newbert. I am the technical manager for insecticides in the UK and Ireland. Uh, and as such, I'll be very similar to Michael going through the sort of regulatory update pipeline and then touching at the end of current chemistry, focusing on Minecto 1. Uh, but to start off, like Michael said, we're, we are in flux. And from my area of or portfolio, it's Lambda, Cyhalothrin and, and Teflufrin that have been going through re-registration. So with Lambda, it is still going through re-registration and this is the active itself. So what the likely outcomes are has been sort of indicated by CRD, but uh, without specifics. So we are expecting to keep Lambda. That's not going to be an issue. The, the changes that are likely to happen are that labels uh, for all Lambda contained products will have stipulations of total grams of AI per hectare. So there won't be switching between labels anymore um, on top of a potential reduction in certain crops on the label um, reduction in rates. So individual rates and then overall application numbers so the max rate as well be reduced but we are confident we'll keep it but there will definitely be some changes however as i said no specific specifics as yet but we will let you know when we find out the other thing is teflufrin so primarily false st that's active went for re-registration and um, came out so that was good and we don't expect any changes until 24 or 27, um, but we don't foresee any issues in the immediate term. So teflufrin is safe as an AI. However, because of the re-registration, we were then having to transfer the emus of the minor crops onto the new map number. Um, however, it became apparent because the force ST, and you can see the data on the screen, is based on sugar beet as, a, as the crop, we have a 13 grams a hectare rate. Now, if you look at, you know, onions are given here as an example, but if you if you do the rate we have been conducting with that, we are well and above, you know, over double that for the current label rate. And then the other problem we face is the fact that sugar beet is a pelleted seed. Now, it's not economically viable for more or less all the minor crop producers to use pelleted seed. So ourselves this year, a lot of our work is going into, can we address this and get film coated seed it's as accepted because of the uh, bird mammal uh, interaction issue and then if we can't overcome the total grammage can we get enough efficacy from such a rate um, in the minor crops to warrant treatment basically now we are looking at this and we're also looking at alternative backups in the future of different uh, potential products we could bring in so there is um, options we're exploring but right now that's how it stands but that being said, we did actually get a reversal of the map number for a short period to produce enough uh, on the old map number in 2020 to then sell into the seed houses for 2021 use so that the emus could continue to be used in the short term so we could have time to address the CRD issues basically. So we expect falls to be on total use uh, on emus this year, potentially some in 2022. However, the what is available as in uh, volume is enough to treat 2021, maybe a small part of 2022, but because it's treated in 2021 and sown in 22, there also has to be the realization there might be a slight reduction in efficacy due to the fact after sort of three month period of treated seed to planting, you will lose some teflufrin to volatilization. So that does have to be taken into account. But once we know more, again, we'll inform the industry. But more on the positive notes or the future pipeline, um, one of the new things, and it is a, a very recent uh, development, is the Afinto product. Now, some of you might have already seen this. It is actually registered on CRD, but we're not going to have product to sell until 2022. And what Afinto is, it is a clone registration of um, planicomid. So it'll have exactly the same uh, crops on label as Topeki does right now. Um, 
we are still finding out uh, what we can do with the product, but at the moment it will be a uh, another option to, to Peaky in what Peaky currently has on label. So for brassicas, I think it's cabbage and Brussels sprouts. Um, but obviously it gives the industry another member of uh, the you know R and D companies to work with, uh, potentially developing the product. So that's you know very much of interest to ourselves for second pest control. The other area, and I've included this because there has been some press releases about this, is uh, spiripidion. Now spiripidion is a very similar mode of action to spirotetramat, but is a completely new AI. As such, it has those properties, so you know sucking pests, white fly, potentially thrips, um, but it's slightly slower acting uh, with its mode of action. But it does make it very safe for beneficials, and we will be targeting the veg sector with this uh, primarily. I've put 2025 plus on there. It's more likely to be 2027 for introduction. So it is a bit far off, but in the next few years, I, I plan to start doing trials with this. So uh, as we get more data um, generated for crops relevant to ourselves, we can disseminate that information. So that was the sort of quick update on regulation and uh, new still pipeline coming through. So moving on to just a, a quick reminder of what currently we have uh, in the portfolio for brassic crops. Obviously, Minetta one we've had a few years now, and just on screen is what we currently have on label. Uh, now this is important because I'm going to talk about sort of the added benefits of Minetta one in the following slides. But you can see the the range of brassicas we have, and on the label currently is uh, for brassicas is basically caterpillar pests, and then obviously late generation carriage root fly, thinking of third generation, something like that for buttons on uh, Brussels sprouts. We get two applications and you know quite tight uh, intervals and post harvest intervals, so it's quite a useful product. Um, however, really what I want to focus on, especially because going forwards, we, you know, this year, and it will pop up in a second, we'll, we have lost thioclopridine, we have lost pimetrazine. So what that means for us is that they're we're starting to lose those actives that have sucking pest control. So primarily, obviously, misers, uh, but just in general, we are losing those actives. So on the screen, I've sort of um, come up with a, a matrix to sort of state perceived efficacy or, you know, trial efficacy, infield efficacy we've seen with Minecto 1. So everything in green is incidental control because it's not on label, but it's what we've seen in trials and in field since launch compared to, you know, acetam and periods, spinosad, spy you know, across the board of, of a few other actors, which are, you know, non-generalist, non-pyrephory type products, because they might be the ones we're interested to compare against. Now, usually if you look at the other products, generally you have either like a, a, a sucking pest active or you have a chewing pest active, where Minecto 1 actually is a, has a very wide range of pests it can control. You know, for yourselves specifically, peach potato aphids is a key concern. It does do mealy cabbage aphid very well as well. Um, we have seen flea beetle adult and larval reductions uh, when it's been used as well. Uh, I've put quite good efficacy there. I've seen good efficacy on Swede midge. I've put two ticks there primarily because um, obviously it's very hard to make sure the application goes on in time before missing the Swede midge coming in and disappearing. Um, pyrephoids, I still think, if you time them well, can have a little bit better knockdown, but we do get good efficacy. There's some things Minecto doesn't do, so this is why I wouldn't really necessarily class it as a aphicide per se, because there's certain aphids it just doesn't have any control on. So you know, comparing especially to acetamiprid and neonicotinoid, Nasanovia current less is aphid it just doesn't have any effect on. Obviously, not a problem for uh, really thinking about brassicas, but it's just to say there is a spectrum of aphid control, but for what we're interested in, it's exceptionally good. And then obviously everything, you know, a white fly is probably the one to pull out for yourselves um, there, very good efficacy. But for everything it's got on label, uh, cabbage root fly, diamondback moth in particular, and also just to make people aware, we, the most recent label extension of uh, Minecto 1 has been in, in alliums, and that is primarily for onion thrips, but we have seen good thrip control in trials where it's been used in brassicas as well. And as I said, it's, it's important to know all, all the different things Minecto can control with its active being cyan, tranilopril, or diamide. It's a, it's a different mode of action than any of the sort of on-label, uh, other on-label insect size for brassicas. Um, closest is Corrigin if you use that under emus, but the second generation uh, diamide in Minecto 1 means we have this added benefit of second pest control. So it is, it is good to understand that planning programs going forwards. However, there is the caveat, especially for brassicas, and I've tried to summarise this as simply as possible for the different crop groups that have on label, is 
for brassicas primarily, you do need an adjuvant. Primarily, what we've seen work best are high percent methylated rape seed oils, such as phase two. And this is because minectoin is a works by uh, on the muscles as a diamide, for second method, primarily for ingestion. The formulation for minectoin is a WG. So without the uh, oil, we don't get penetration into the plant because it is xylem mobile. If we can get into the xylem, they will consume it when they uh, feed from the xylem and phloem, and that way they will get controlled. So absolutely a necessary inclusion to get the incidental control of sucking and leaf boring pests. The other thing I didn't point out was the leaf miner there. But the other crops, it's sort of like, you know, I'd say advise. Generally, we get slightly better numerical control, but it's not the night and day difference that we have in brassicas. The lettuce, uh, we don't see much of a benefit due to the fact it's a very absorbent crop and obviously a lot of leaf area. But let's uh, sort of delve into that control just to show the benefits. So, you know, visually here, you can see the benefits of the Minecto 1 on dying back moth. This was control um, and, you know, compared to the untreated, it is, it is really outstanding. And personally, this is the product for dying back moth control. Um, even compared to very malt, which is the same, you know, active ingredient as Minecto 1, because when it's dry, especially, you know, we've been seeing what Nigel was saying about dry maize, if it's dry and we're relying on a drench, the systemicity can cause less efficacy than you might imagine. But obviously as a foliar, you get it on the plant and you get very good control regardless of uh, weather conditions. But with that being said, just a, a visual back in 2016 with Fanny and Brasket Centre. So the first chart here is dying back moth. And you can see this is number of per plant. So the control the lower, the better. And you can see it doesn't matter what type of adjuvant we use or how much um, or none at all. It is a phenomenal product on uh, camp, uh, dying back moth. Uh, no doubt about that. But what's interesting, in the same trial, we did get um, Mises, so peach potato aphid. So when you're comparing this to more aphicide type products of pymetrazine by um, you can see this is the real night and day difference here, where if you don't have an adjuvant, you basically get no control at all. Um, it just doesn't work because it's not in the plant and acting for ingestion. As soon as we add an oil in, so Actorob is basically phase two, so half a litre in the tank uh, with Minecto 1. Uh, Codicide is another type of oil uh, product, so very similar acting as an adjuvant. And you can just see here how much better we're in line with other aphicides. We're you know, getting the same efficacy of a difficult control pest. And we, we have been monitoring this and there is no cyanotronilaprol resistance in Mises in the UK. So that's fantastic as well. And then similar for, for whitefly and other sucking type pests. And uh, you can see back in 2014, you know, the one to compare against here really is the, the Aspire Tetra map, but you can see this is adults um, number. So lower is better, so the untreated on the left there. But you can see again, very much like we saw with aphids, if you put the, the adjuvant in, that's when we get levels of control similar or you know, just as good as other uh, white fly products. So it does have that flexibility for the season. And personally, also for any leaf miner pests, if you're worried about leaf miner pests, um, it is night and day difference as soon as you get, uh, you know, this product into the plant versus, you know, if you're trying to do anything with pyrethroids or uh, Aspire and Tetramat products. So this was from Warwick. Uh, crop center. So again, just showing the range of pests you can have control with the two seasons. So the only caveat it being is that you do have to think about this at the start of the season because there is a limit to the amount of cyanotronic you can put on a hectare per calendar year. So if if very mark, you know, the drenched cyanotronic from FMC is used, that me basically discounts any use of Minecto 1 in field following. So especially if you're double cropping, that leaves one crop with completely without potentially any cyanotronoprol actives there. Um, but otherwise, it just means we could potentially have issues later in the season with the lack of foliar products we're having. So just put some tables together really to talk about, you know, how does it compare spinner salad as a drench compared to um, cyanotronoprol and the former very mark as a drench. And just to pull out, we do get very good coverage of root fly protection from spinner salad, which obviously is the primary reason we're using very mark. And you can see at the top here, very mark um, back in 2015, looking at this trial. Obviously, other products in this trial, but spinners have been the one we're really comparing against. And you can see statistically similar. Uh, we're getting very good levels of control with both products. Uh, in this, numerically better with spinners ad. So, this is percent plants destroyed by coverage root fly. And then at the end of the season, what was the marketability? And you can see again, statistically similar, but uh, spinners had working very, very well against coverage root fly. Because obviously the other other reason you would be using 
very mark is the vigor it gives. Now, it does give vigor. Cyanotriloprol, we do know, has a vigor benefit. But we did a, a bit of an experiment uh, back a few years ago with um, Ali and Breskison to just have a, a look at how much this vigor affects the crop through the season. So we did a, quite a few different um, things just to focus in on what the vigor was. So this vigor assessment here, obviously higher is better, was done through the season when it was out in field. Compared to the old uh, clopyrifos drench, with no perceived figure benefit. Um, Science and Pro on its own then had a following program. Spinner's had on its own. And then just to see where the vigor was coming from, because obviously when we first had Berry Mark, it was in conjunction with uh, Cruiser. So there was a sort of doubling of vigor benefits products on there. And you can see here, you know, there was no significant difference. And this is this is a, a quote from um, our Nebraska Center. The only real vigor is, uh, was seen in the great greenhouse. Now the caveat, obviously this was done in cabbage. For your short cycle crops like broccoli, uh, it might be a different story. It might give you that bigger benefit. And I think that's where very much can fit very well um, because they're, they're shorter in the field. It gives protection over that period and that bigger effect for the, the rapid cycle of those crops can be a benefit. But for other crops, I think um, potentially having a spinner says start to the season. So you can cover the entire season with Minepto if the, there is an issue or if not, you don't need it. Either way, looking at the numbers, generally it works out cheaper as a program as well. And just to you know, talk about the very mark protection, uh, we did some work right back, uh, I think it was 2016, 15, um, with BBRO looking at how does control of Mises in, this is uh, laboratory condition, so we can keep adding aphids to it weekly to see what the level of control for persistence is for the product. So we had Cruiser and Verimark in this trial. You can see the level we used to get with Cruiser, but just to say with Verimark, it does work, but it does fluctuate. And then after sort of four or five weeks does start to uh, dwindle in protection a bit. So it does offer some aphid protection, um, but doesn't perform quite as well as previous uh, products we've had for aphid control at the start of the season. And just a visual of that on the left there, the untreated um, in the center, we've got the cruiser and then on the right, very mark, looking very similar with the number of misers on the plant compared to the untreated. So if there's high pressure, which might not necessarily be this year, but like we had last year, uh, especially if it's dry in May, this could cause a lot of issues actually. And just to visualize that, th this is five years of both dying back moth in the bars and misers in the purple line over the season. So March going into April, May, June, July, and then into the autumn months. What the average numbers caught in the UK are. Now, obviously, especially with back Moth, this is a changeable feast, but this is sort of the window we could have invasion through. Um, this year, if you look at the, the weather data, I'm predicting really sort of the 29th of May, early June is the first fight for Miser. So our peak of Miser is probably pushed back a bit. So from my point of view, you know, very mark will work very well for um, rapid cycling crops early season when there isn't too much pressure because it will it will cover the entire season for that plant um, and if there is a bit of pressure it's not going to be too high and be um, overwhelmed and hopefully it will be during a period that isn't too dry whereas as soon as you get past that bit for flexible control especially going through this entire seasonal period which is you know months potentially the crop could be exposed to certain pests having two applications of an ecto instead of just one berry mark might offer that more flexibility you know, depending on if it's misers, white ply, thrips, um, or obviously dying back moth coming in at a later period or a very dry period. So that, that was all sort of my summary of, you know, what's coming through, regulatory challenges, and just, just a thought on planning for the season. Obviously some uh, plans might have already been made, especially for the early uh, planted crops, but following later May planting onwards, it might be something to think about for what your program will consist of this year. Otherwise, thank you very much for your attention and I'll hand back to Rebecca. Thank you very much, Max. Excellent. Right, we've got a, a few questions in, so if uh, everyone can turn their, themselves uh, the videos and mute off, that'd be brilliant. So we'll start with a question for Michael. Um, have you seen any resistance developing to Amistar slash Amistar top in Alton area or ring spot? Um, a short answer to that is no, but theoretically, you know, Alton area resistance occurs in um, early blight in potatoes in some of those crops in Europe. So it's certainly a possibility. It's not something I've come across, but obviously I've only been back in the veg sector for the last year, so yeah. to speak. So it's something that 
um, we I may have to pick up on with our experts uh, in Basel on, but it's not something I'm aware of at the moment. No, certainly not something that's, that's come my way either. So, but yeah. Um, one for Max, and I'm assuming this is referring to Menecto, so anything for kale or greens? Um, at, at the moment, no. I mean, the, the problem we always face with leafy brassicas is we're applying the product directly to the, to the well, to the product, aren't we? Um, so it comes to, um, down to MRL issues mostly with that. So unfortunately, not at this moment. And staying on the Minecto theme, um, what water volumes would you recommend when using Minecto and an adjuvant? Um, <sighs> Well, when we've been looking at trials, um, and uh, to be honest with this, the last time we did a sort of adjuvant and water volume piece, that was, I think, back in 2015. Um, and we were primarily looking at um, Brussels sprouts and late cabbage root fly attack. And in that trial, it was, um, I think the best outcome was a litre of um, phase two at 200 litres of water, um, but that's a good question. I'll, I'll, I can uh, try and find some information out about that and get back to you on that one, because um, off the top of my head, I can't quite remember how the antivent piece interacted with the water volume, because it will change the droplet size, obviously. Okay, um, and there's a question around cabbage root fly in drilled swede. Um, what would the options for, for growers be if they don't have any mesh to cover the swedes with? Can you just repeat the question again, Rebecca? So cabbage root fly in drilled swede. Mm -hmm. um, the grower, unfortunately, doesn't have any mesh. So what are, what are his options? Uh, oh, that one's a different limited. one. <laughs> yeah, limited, I think, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I can't be more helpful with that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is one that I'll probably take, but um, there's a question on um, apron Excel on transplants in the glass house and where do we stand? Um, the answer to that at the minute is a little bit unclear um, because we haven't had a full answer from CRD yet, um, but there is a possibility um, and there has been an indication from CRD that they will withdraw all metal axil M seed treatments on the first of, on the first of June, and then we will have to re-register them. So, but that hasn't been confirmed yet, um, and this is all very much in the air. And we're trying to push CRD as fast as we can, which is obviously not particularly fast when it comes to CRD, to try and get some answers and some clarity for people. Um, because obviously we're very conscious that um, we that CRD haven't communicated anything or on any of these products or any of their databases, so it's it's quite unfair for them to try and enforce this first of June date. So at the moment you'll have to bear with us, um, and we're trying to get as much information as we can. And as soon as we have more information, we will let you have it. But there is a possibility that you might not be able to use um, it on transplants for the time being. So another one here, any new products coming through for drenching Dutch cabbage? I'm not aware of no, anything. No, I don't think so. As a post-harvest protectant material, was they thinking? Doesn't say. Right. right. Not not sure is the answer, I'm afraid. No, I haven't heard anything. Uh, Nigel or Louis, have you heard of any new drenches or anything coming? No, I haven't. Really? No. No, I haven't. What are they thinking? Are they are they thinking for the aphids and things like we had with with fighter drip and things? I would have thought so. I would have thought that's where the concern is. I don't know. It doesn't That's where stay. The concern is, I would yeah. say. So, Max, what's your uh, thoughts there? Well, it, we're always looking at things, but at this moment in time, there's nothing that's um, ready to, you know, be in the market in the short term. Okay. Well, that's all of the um, 
questions answered that we've had through at the moment, unless anybody types something through really quickly. Um, oh, apparently, um, AHDB are doing a project on post harvest drenches. So, I wasn't sure whether, whether he was referring to a sort of a pre planting drench or a post harvest. Like, oh, yeah, yeah you're, you're quite right, they are looking at that area. Yeah, so there's a project happening in, in that area which we're not involved in, unfortunately. Cutting right. up your bricks, aren't they? Yeah, I, I told them to wait until 11, and in fairness, they've waited till 10 past. So we'll wrap this up there because there are no more um, questions coming through. So thank you very much, presenters, for your time. Thank you very much, audience. We hope you found that useful. Um, and if you have any further questions, then please don't hesitate to contact any of us. Cheers now. Thank, thank you, Dan. Bye for now. Thank you, everybody. Cheers, everyone.